in the in the program, you might see that it says I work at Campaign Monitor. I actually uh, uh, didn't pass probation a few weeks ago with that company, so I can tell you a story about where uh, the quality coach role didn't quite work out. Um, uh, but I'll be starting a new job when I get back to Sydney for mobile testing. So my specialty has been mobile. It's one of my passions. And um, I want to show you a robot that I built in a two-day hackathon today. So uh, there, was a, there was a competition to name the robot. Uh, first of all, put your hand up if you've done an Arduino project before. Cool. How about, you know, involved with mobile testing on some level? There we go. Uh, so there was a competition to name the robot uh, during the hackathon. So it was named uh, Taffy McTapface. Um, I'm going to kick you off with a demo first. Um, this is Taffy over here. I'm going to exit out of my browser, go to my IDE uh, or my terminal. Um, I'm going to start a node server on my local machine. There we go. Go over to here. You can you can see the. There we go. Uh, back over here, and I will just type in this function. So um, that's just a, a, a demo of a Christmas Carol. Uh, I built this robot as during a, a hackathon just before Christmas. Uh, so it was themed with uh, Christmas. But maybe you can recognize the uh, next, next tune. It's a little bit more complicated. I just had a bolt come off. Um, at, least, uh, at least my prayers to the demo, demo gods were answered and nothing exploded. <laughs> but I lost a bolt. Where did that bolt come from? I don't know. I'll have to find out later. Anyway. So now that I've got the demo out of the way, I'll go through the rest of the presentation. Uh, it's an open source design based on Tapster 2.0. Uh, it's all 3D printed. You can access the source code. Was originally designed by Jason Huggins, one of the founders of the Selenium. You know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the amazing team that helped out with this. You can see uh, version one of the Tapster in this image. Uh, the configuration's a little different. Uh, it's actually there playing Angry Birds as well. Uh, so you can use it to play video games if you like. Uh, all of the parts are 3D printed. Uh, we had a, um, at my previous company, we got a 3D printer uh, for a, to give away as a prize at a conference we were sponsoring. Uh, but they wanted to allow the engineers to play with the 3D printer. So instead of just buying one to give out as a, as a prize, we bought two, one for the office and one for the conference. Uh, so I was able to use the printer in the office for this um, just before the hackathon. I also, it took me about 20 hours to print most of the parts. Um, note to self, do not put things on the edge of the printer um, or else you might get some mistakes. <laughs> so um, they, they were printing off fine and this took, I don't know, 45 minutes, but it took a long time to find out that it had started to go off the edges a little bit. Um, I also went to my local hackerspace um, out in Sydney t 
to laser cut some of the larger parts. Um, the base and the, and the clear parts were laser cut rather than printed. Um, so if you have the opportunity to go check out your local space, it's an amazing community. Um, and they're always full of really helpful people who are happy to show you how to do anything there. Users an um, Arduino on the top and a three server motor configuration. The three server motors are arranged in a delta bot config. Um, this is often used on the industrial line, uh, maybe in a chocolate factory where you have to pick things up and place them with precision over and over again. Um, so that's why this design is, is useful for this one. Uh, uses magnets and ball bearings for joints. I'm actually just going to disassemble Taffy here and pass around some parts for you. Ah, oh, that's where the bolt came off. I have to reattach the servo motor later. Yeah. That's not going to work. So uh, Taffy is now armless. You now have a, a piece of it in your possession. Uh, it took about two days worth of build time. Um, I spent some time after work building it once I printed all the materials and I spent a day in the hacker space, but it was surprisingly quick. I thought it would take a lot longer than I expected to build. Uh, it cost me about $300 in parts, which that's in Australian dollars, that's about 15,000 rupees. Um, but I was trying to follow an American build of materials. Um, I ordered a lot of the parts from American stores and that increased the postage. I probably paid uh, about $100 worth of postage for most of these parts. Um, but now that I've built one, uh, it would be easier to, or I'd know what materials I'd need to find locally. So I should be able to build that a bit cheaper. Uh, and I don't know what the prices are for electronics alike here in India or if there's a market for Arduino or local suppliers for a lot of these things. Uh, the play piano algorithm, we hacked away in uh, one and a half days. I pair programmed with a developer um, while we did this exercise. I thought I'd have a lot more issues with calibration. Uh, it didn't take as long as I was expecting to build. I thought the first thing out of the, the fence was was going to be just trying to get it to touch the screen, and, but most of the hard work had already been done. Runs the standard FAMATA protocol on the Arduino chip itself. That just allows you to translate uh, whatever language you want to run on your local machine, such as Node um, or other languages, and it just translates it into the uh, Arduino machine code uh, or assembly-like language. I don't really know this in details. It's just the magic of the technology. It was pretty easy to get up and running. Uh, I'm running a node server on my local machine. Uh, and it also uses the Johnny5 API, which is um, a JavaScript API for robotics, Internet of Things. Uh, it's been around since 2012. I haven't seen if there's been any local commits to it lately. Uh, but it's all open source. This is part of the, if you go to Huggins' uh, source repository for this, this is some of the maths that's involved for translating the rotations of the motors into X, Y, Z coordinates. So I didn't actually have to do the maths myself. It had already been figured out. Um, we have, um, you pass in your coordinates, you do a little bit of maths, uh, either reflecting and rotating, and then basically just palm out those angles to the, to the server motors um, using a map function. But this was all done beforehand, so it was a lot. I didn't have to uh, figure out all the, the maths and the tricky bits myself. Uh, if you know, uh, this is a piano uh, layout, uh, and we're mapping each key to a area. So for example, we have the F3 key here, and the black one here is the F3 sharp. Put your hand up if you come from a music background. Okay. We're going to have like a really brief 
uh, overview of uh, music theory in this talk as well. So automation and music theory go hand in hand, right? Uh, so for that F3 key, we map where it's pressed and where it's lifted because we want the robot to move from uh, above the key before it presses and then back up. Before it moves to the next one, uh, it moves to the lifted phase and then presses and then back up. Um, so we've just mapped out the X, Y, Z coordinates of where those keys are. Uh, we did that through a lot of manual process. Using that go function, we would just pass in X, Y, Z uh, and figure out where the button was on the, on the key and, uh, and then just coded that into our uh, source. So it's, it's currently hard coded. It's not uh, calibrated for the screen. And um, so it's just, uh, just off my, um, based off my iPhone 6 screen size. So it, it doesn't accommodate different resolutions just yet. But I did have a Pixel at one point and the keys were close enough that it still worked. Um, I use the S here after the F3 to represent that black key, the sharp key. And that has a slightly different area. Um, this was the, I play trombone. Um, so this was the sheet music for uh, the Imperial March. Um, you can see that we have a lot of flats in the key signature. Um, that means I had to transpose this music um, into uh, the, the keyboard on my screen size. I had to transpose it into a different key. Um, I also had to convert all of the flats into sharps as well because I've written all the notes as sharps. Um, a sharp and a flat are the same thing. Um, it's just a different way of um, talking about it. Um, for example, that, that F we talked about, the F sharp is also a G flat. So they're, they're pretty easy to, to convert. Um, you can see here that it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, and if you remember back to the demo of the robot, it, the timing wasn't quite right. It can play the slow notes uh, quite well, but when you try to introduce more complicated timing, uh, it tends to uh, stuff up a little bit. Uh, and it was hard to get this to work. I think the next phase for this robot would be to figure out how to get the timing more right, because we're just uh, basing each, each bar has four beats, and we're breaking each bar into sixteenths, and then we're just mapping them back to the, to the robot. But you play a note for one sixteenth that's not in the same ratio as a, uh, a, quarter, bar, a quarter note. For, and then we map each song into its own function, and we pass in a string that represents the, the music. So for example, here we've got a method called play advance, and this means play the F3 key for four sixteenths of a bar. This one here means play the G3 sharp key for one sixteenth of a bar. So that's how we've converted music into uh, code for this robot. So how can this help you test? In the grand scheme of things, probably not that much. Um, <laughs> I've built this robot as part of a hackathon to demonstrate how robots could be used for testing. Uh, but I still haven't found any really good valid use cases other than bringing it to conferences and giving really good demos. <laughs> um, I was a contractor at Google Maps at one point and there was one feature where it could have made sense to do this type of testing. So I was helping triage bugs that came through for public transport. And uh, one of the local teams in Sydney was working on a new feature that uh, if you were walking up to a bus stop or a train station, you get a notification uh, alerting you to the timetable of that bus stop or train station um, within the next five or ten minutes. So as you're walking around the city, you'd probably get notifications of, of different commute notifications. And um, uh, the first way to test that is to try and fake your GPS location. Um, but the uh, uh, Android system underneath is too smart for that. You can't just fake your GPS location and have this feature work. Uh, it's uh, a bit trickier than that. Uh, and the way Google Maps models the world, they have these beacons everywhere. And so sometimes you actually have to walk into a beacon and then out of a beacon to trigger this um, uh, feature. So it introduced problems with testing. They also wanted to do battery testing uh, with this feature too. Uh, one of the ideas I put forward with, with how to test this on over a large scale, because you needed the robot, or you needed the phone to be moving. 
if we just attach this robot to a Roomba um, and let the Roomba drive around the office for three hours getting in and out of access points um, while, while this interacted with the app, I think that would have been one way to hack uh, long-term battery testing um, for this feature if we wanted to. But being able to do the same test at the same time on two different devices, I guess, would have been a bit tricky too. Um, but I, I imagine that's been one of the few cases I could use this robot for testing. I'll go through some lessons learned through building this. Um, the instructions to build were uh, uh, a little bit all over the place. I don't think they were in a central repository on the internet. I did have to find some other ones and there seemed to be a little bit of a mismatch. They might have been based on the previous version of the Tapster robot. I probably should add some of my own uh, instructions on the internet, but I've been too lazy. <laughs> Contributing to open source and, and, and whatnot is, is uh, not high up on the priority list at the moment, unfortunately. But um, I printed too many parts, but now that some of the parts are broken, I'm actually glad I printed more parts. Um, but I meant that the build of materials didn't have quite the right list of things I needed to get going. Um, and the bolts that I ordered, uh, I had issues with the bolts. I ended up, uh, because it was using an American build of materials, all the bolts were in uh, like inches and uh, 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 the threading per inch and uh, sizing and whatnot. And, um, we don't really, you can't really go to the hardware store in Australia and get those nuts and bolts um, because of metric. Um, so I, I pro, but I did just end up getting some bolts, nuts and bolts from the local hardware store, which were close enough anyway. But um, it added that extra layer of, uh, I wasn't too sure what to do. Um, any questions on that? I do have some bonus material that I would like to go through. Cool, we are up to bonus material. So now you, you can build a robot and you can automate whatever you like. Hopefully it's inspired you to play around with a little bit of Arduino. My next Arduino project will probably be uh, one of those autonomous gardening systems that can do the weeding and the watering and whatnot. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, but so you can, there's this question of sure, I can automate all of this, but where do I start? How do I start my automation? Um, and go from there. So I'm gonna walk you through a visual risk-based framework that I developed with one of my previous teams to help answer that question. So I will exit out of this one. Uh, the previous company I was working at was uh, called Tyro. I'll just give you a little bit of context. They do FPOS uh, terminals. So if you go to your cafe or your florist, you use a uh, terminal to pay for a card. Uh, a card to pay for your transaction, order a coffee, whatnot. Um, they have a microservice backend. Um, they utilize test-driven development and pair programming was a huge part of their culture there. So collaboration was pretty much part of their culture. Uh, just as an example, every machine was set up for pair programming. So you'd have one machine, uh, two monitors, two keyboards and mouse, mice, ma what's the plural for, I don't know. Um, but each, each workstation would be set up for pair programming. Um, and often the way this would work, someone would drive, someone would have the keyboard and mouse and someone else would provide feedback. And then it might switch and change. It's a really interesting environment to work in if you ever get the chance to. Um, so I'm going to get into the framework. Uh, first, you can break your app into flows. For example, say with a banking app, you might do registration. My video not working. I guess not. Uh, let's see. Oh no, there we go. I just needed to go back and so Darth Vader is logging into his banking because even Darth Vader has to uh, uh, charge on credit cards. Uh, and he's going through the two-factor authentication, setting up a password, setting up a PIN. Now he's in his bank account. He has five hundred and twenty dollars. You might want to transfer funds. Have a look through your previous history just to make sure that a transaction went through. You might want to send off a contact us request. If there's something happening, you want to question something, 
you can send off the contact us request and uh, Tyro will give you a phone call at a convenient time. You might want to change your PIN. You might think your PIN's compromised. So you enter your old PIN and you enter your new PIN twice. And logging in. There we go. So we've analyzed all of the flows of our app. Unfortunately, most apps out there don't quite have six flows. But now that we've had a think of all the different ways through our app, uh, we're going to map these flows onto a risk board. So on our x-axis, we're going to put our frequency of use. If something uh, low frequency on the left-hand side, high frequency on the right side. Uh, we're going to put our impact if broken on the, on the y-axis and draw a nice little graph like this. Break it up into three areas. And we're going to start with number one. Registration has um, a fairly low frequency of use. It shouldn't happen all that often, but it has a really high impact on the user. If the user can't register, something has gone terribly wrong. So I would like you to pair up with someone new, say hi. Uh, we are networking at this conference after all. And I would like you to map out the other six things that are on that sheet with someone. There are some of these uh, worksheets that you can use up at the front. If you want to come on down. We're friendly people. We don't bite that hard. Oh, um, so on the up here we have some sheets. You're going to be using, doing the same sort of thing that Sam has up here uh, on worksheets up here to Repeat your instructions, Sam. To uh, move the sticky notes. Um, to do risk analysis on the flows, we're just going to map them um, into uh, where we think they should go. Do we have sheets up there? Oh, yeah. Yep. All the sheets are up in the front here. OK. How are we going with that exercise? Hopefully by having a conversation with someone, you realize that we have different understandings of risk. We all apply our risk radar differently. So it is perfectly fine for you to have a different answer than I do because the context of when I did this exercise is completely different to your context. You're going to have a different understanding of where these things should go. But for example, transfer funds is probably a higher frequency of use of registration and also a pretty high impact. If you can't get money out of your bank account, you can't run your business. You might want to view your transactions. But maybe you don't do that as often, and there might be some sort of workaround. You can also access previous transactions on the terminal itself as well. Uh, so maybe you don't care so much if it's broken in app. Contact us. You might even question why you have this in the app in the first place. Uh, <laughs> Um, because you can generally access our, our phone number from our website and give us a call uh, whenever you need. Um, but there, there might be regulatory reasons why that feature is in the app. Being able to change PIN, you should probably put your hand up if you've ever changed the PIN on your bank account. Oh, surprisingly large amount. I, I've actually, since I've been banking for 15 years, I actually haven't changed the PIN on my... Uh, on my bank account. Um, but it has a pretty high impact. If you're concerned that your PIN is compromised um, and it doesn't go through correctly, um, that's a pretty major issue. And being able to log in, it's the first thing you do before uh, you do anything. And if you can't do this, then shit has hit the fan, to use an Australianism. Um, you might want to map different areas of risk as well. So we'll give the stuff in the upper quadrant three stars to say, this is really important. We might want to focus our automation on these areas first because we think these areas are going to impact our customers the most. If there's a bug in this area, we want to find out about it first before our customers do. This area, you might give two stars. You might go, we might be okay with releasing stuff with bugs in this area 
as we, as we iterate, um, but we would like to know about them at some point. And here you might question uh, why bother testing this on a, at least from an automation point of view. What value does it add to have a UI test for the contact us request? Other than it gives you at coverage. You might want to map other elements of risk as well. This is only a 2D representation. You might want to put like a sticky note or a color on something that might have security implications. So number five, change pin, even though from a user's point of view, it might have um, a low frequency of use, it might have security implications. So this might drive your influences around, we might put more automation here, even though we think it's a, a low use feature because of uh, security risks. Uh, and here's an example of the one I used at Tyro. It grew out to a bit more than six, uh, but this was just as we were launching our banking platform and starting to do our Android app as well. We started on iOS. Um, but having this next to the board and when we were developing a new feature and going, where do we think this fits in the grand scheme of things would help us determine what type of automation we might want to build for this before we've built that. So it helped facilitate those conversations. Um, I've also used the key to represent uh, other uh, potential risks as well, things that might have a financial impact or a legal impact from running your own business. Next, we can break these flows into tests, but I'm going to check how I'm going for time. 20 minutes left? Okay, I'll continue going. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through um, a whiteboard exercise to be able to think through your testing. Uh, we're going to number our flow here. For example, our change pin. We're going to walk through this one. We're going to put an orange sticky note here to represent this one. Next, we're going to go through our setup for the test. What type of data do we need beforehand? We're going to use the pink sticky notes here to represent that we need to be registered and we need to be logged into the app before we start this test. So, for example, we need to be presented with the home screen. The next thing is the going through the tests, uh, the, the steps and the checks. I'm going to use blue here to represent a user action. So, for example, we click on the hamburger side menu. We click on the uh, options tab. And we have some sort of expected outcome. I'm going to use a green sticky note here. See menu list. We see this screen. And I'm going to continue through the, the, the process here. So next, I'm going to use blue. We're going to click on change passcode. We're going to click here or tap. So I shouldn't say click because it's an app. And we should see the change passcode screen. So from here, when you change your PIN in app, you enter your old PIN uh, once and then your new PIN twice. What are some of the other things we could test in this situation. The entering the same pin, trying to change it to the same pin? Yeah? Session timeout is another good one. Incorrect old PIN, what do we do with that situation? So hopefully you, re um, uh, you realize that there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do. We could enter the correct PIN and continue down the path. We could enter incorrect PIN and stay on the current thing. We could enter a PIN after a session timeout. We can enter the phone in airplane mode and ensure the next network call fails and see what happens in the app. Um, we can also press the back button uh, and go back to the previous screen without so all of these, is, it's, it's really good for brainstorming for exploratory testing to do this type of walkthrough, to go at each point in each screen, what can I possibly do? And, and go, it doesn't make sense to automate all of these things. But for example, trying to put your phone to sleep and then relaunching the app, um, Appium itself doesn't really support this feature very easily. Um, or the Xcode's uh, UI automation test suite doesn't support this type of testing either. As soon as you put your app to sleep, uh, your test stops running. And you, it's, it's kind of hard to relaunch that test. But in terms of manual testing, that type of test is fairly cheap to do. 
Um, you can invest a lot of engineering into doing that type of test, but you have to question the value it adds. Um, as a, we're going to go do a segue down uh, more of a non-hacky path case. If we enter the incorrect pin, um, we will see a notification saying that the incorrect pin was, was entered. Um, if you continue then to enter it incorrectly two more times, you actually lock the pin. So through doing this exercise, I've discovered a new flow. I'm going to call it number seven, lock pin. I'm going to go back to my uh, sheet there and, and map out where I think lock pin fits into everything else. But um, through doing this type of analysis, I've discovered a new feature. But this, this test we're talking about here is about the change pin. So I'm just going to take a note and come back to that later. Um, and I'm also not going to go all the way down the error path but I might just merge this enter incorrect pin once and then enter correct pin um, just to get that coverage over UI. I think your UI automation should be just testing the flow through the app. Um, this comes with some caveats of um, it does mean you have less tests. They do get slightly more coverage, but it makes them harder to debug. And in my team, we weren't reporting on the number of tests. Um, we wanted to reduce our build time. Our build time for our iOS app was taking 25, 30 minutes. And um, that was just too long for a fairly straightforward app. And I wanted to try and reduce that down to maybe five or 10 minutes through having this, um, that our UI automation was very on point. Um, unfortunately, the refactoring to do this type of testing uh, it was never prioritized due to product development because developing new features is always, uh, a, always gets a high priority. And then we continue down that, that test there. Just to, just to remind you of what the colors here mean, we've used the orange here to map back to our risk board. We've used the pink here to represent data we set up before or during the test. We might have to do a backend uh, config setup or change while doing some of these tests. Uh, we've used blue here to represent a user action and green for some sort of ch check or success indicator. And here's an example of going through that test in a little bit more detail. I've used fat uh, green arrows here to represent the happy path and the uh, smaller black arrows to represent divergence or non-happy paths. And then we continue from there. But that's the, uh, the segue I wanted to uh, take you down. Uh, I'll But uh, yeah, so uh, have fun with testing. And hopefully this uh, risk framework gives you a, a little bit more of a framework um, or analysis tool um, before you deep dive into automation, taking that step back and thinking about what do I want to automate first. Awesome. Thank you, Sam.